Diodorus Cronus was born sometime in the 4th century BC on the island of Yassos in the eastern Mediterranean. As you will hear in the following fragments, he was considered to be a brilliant thinker who held some positions that were similar to the famous Eleatics. He was at times called a dialectician, a Megarian philosopher, and you will see in the fragments that he also sometimes got lumped in with the Eleatics. The fragments do provide us with some biographical information. Sextus Empiricus tells us of his high reputation, although it seems Diogenes Laertius did not appreciate him so much. Not that I have any great love for Diogenes or trust in his words. Diodorus is also noted in Strabo. I have included these fragments below and will read them out for this recording. There are two printed compilations of the fragments in Testimonia on Diodorus and other dialecticians and Megaric philosophers, although they aren't complete. If you'd like to look those up, you can find citations in Nicholas Denier's article, Neglected Evidence for Diodorus Cronus, where he supplements the compilations with two pieces that were left out. For my part, I don't have a printed compilation. What follows is an assortment of translated fragments that I've found, tidied up, and pieced together into a document for my own use. Given that people appreciated my recording of Melissus's fragments in the attached text, I figured I'd do the same for Diodorus Cronus, especially given that his fragments are not so easy to find. I only ask that when reading them, one keeps in mind who the author is, the period they lived in, their access to materials, their intentions, and whether they are quoting verbatim or presenting their own understanding, whether accurate or convenient. As always, the various fragments may be translated different ways, too. If the various positions and puzzles of Diodorus interest you, I'd recommend checking out some of the secondary source material. You may also wish to download the text version. One of the sections from Sextus Empiricus is much longer than I'll read in this recording. Anyway, as usual, this is just one long recording, so let's begin. Strabo, Diodorus the dialectician, was a native of this place, the island of Yassus. He was surnamed Cronus. The title was not properly his from the first. It was his master, Apollonius, who, in the first instance, had received the surname of Cronus, but it was transferred to Diodorus on account of the want of celebrity in the true Cronus. Sextus Empiricus against those in disciplines. Callimachus in reference to Diodorus Cronus. See there the ravens on the roof's croak. What things are connected? And how will we come to be in future? For Cronus was a superb dialectician and taught how the sound conditional is to be judged. Therefore, because his teaching won out, even the ravens on the houses, from hearing it so much, cried out his judgment on the conditional. The grammarian might say this, and up to this point he will understand what is known even to children. But moving on to, and how will we come to be in future, the grammarian will be silent. He will not find out the thing being indicated. For it falls to the philosopher to say that Diodorus holds that nothing is in motion. For what is in motion, is in motion either in the place in which it is, or in the place in which it is not, but neither the first nor the second. Therefore nothing is in motion. And from nothing's being in motion, it follows that nothing perishes. For just as nothing is in motion, because of something's being in motion neither in the place in which it is, nor in the place in which it is not, in the same way, since what is alive dies neither in the time in which it is alive nor in the time in which it is not alive it never dies but if so we will live forever according to him and will come to be in future diogenes laertius there are also other pupils of eubolides among them apollonius surnamed cronus he had a pupil diodorus 
the son of Amanius of Iasos, who was also nicknamed Cronus. Callimachus, in his epigrams, says of him, Momus himself chalked on the walls. Cronus is wise. He too was a dialectician, and was supposed to have been the first who discovered the arguments known as the veiled figure and the horned one. When he was staying with Ptolemy Sotter, he had certain dialectical questions addressed to him by Stilpo, and, not being able to solve them on the spot, he was reproached by the king, and, among other slights, the nickname Cronus was applied to him by way of derision. He left the banquet, and after writing a pamphlet on the logical problem, ended his days in despondency. Upon him too I have written lines, Diodorus Cronus, what sad fate buried you in despair, so that you hastened to the shades below, perplexed by Stilpo's quibbles. You would deserve your name of Cronus better if C and R were gone. Um, I, it means ass, if you take the letters away. Next fragment is from Lucian, Sale of Lives, Creeds. Note, this is thought to be based on Diodorus Cronus' argument, the veiled one, which we just heard about. The hood in this text is, you know, it's a veil. As to the man in the hood, okay, first speaker, as to the man in the hood, he will surprise you considerably. Answer me now, do you know your own father? Second speaker, yes. First speaker, well now, if I present to you... A man in a hood? Shall you know him, huh? Second speaker. Of course not. First speaker. Well, the man in the hood is your father. You don't know the man in the hood, therefore you don't know your father. Second speaker. Why, no, but if I take his hood off, I shall get at the facts. Now tell me, what is the end of your philosophy? What happens when you reach the goal of virtue? Alexander of Aphrodisias. Diodorus claimed that alone is possible, which either is, or at all events, will be. On his view, for me to be in Corinth was possible if I was already in Corinth, or if I were at all events going to be there. If I were not to be there, then it was not possible either. And it was possible for a child to become literate if he was at all events going to become so. Diodorus puts forward the master argument in order to establish this principle. Boethius Diodorus defines the possible as what is or what will be, the impossible as what is false and will not be true, the necessary as what is true and will not be false, and the non-necessary as what is already false or will be. Epictetus discourses The master argument appears to have been put forth thus. Of the following propositions, any two imply a contradiction with the third. They are these. That every past truth is necessary. That an impossibility does not follow a possibility. And third, that a thing is possible which neither is nor will be true. Diodorus, perceiving this contradiction, combined the first two to prove that it's not possible to have a thing that neither is nor will be true. Some again hold the second and third, that an impossibility does not follow a possibility, and that a thing is possible which neither is nor will be true, and consequently they deny that every past truth is necessary. This is the way Cleanthes and his followers took, whom Antipater copiously defends. Others, lastly, maintain the third and first, that every past truth is necessary, and that a thing is possible which neither is nor will be true, thus denying that an impossibility does not follow a possibility. But all these three propositions cannot be at once maintained because of their mutual contradiction. If anyone should ask me then which of them I maintain, I answer him that I really cannot tell. But I have heard it related that Diodorus held one opinion about them, 
the followers of Panthades, I think, and Cleanthes, another, and Chrysippus, a third. What, then, is your opinion? I express none. I was born to examine things as they appear to my own mind, to compare what is said by others, and thence to form some conviction of my own on any topic. Of these things I have merely technical knowledge. Who was the father of Hector, Priam? Who were his brothers, Paris and Dephobus? Who was his mother, Hecuba? This I have heard related. From whom? Homer. But I believe Hellenicus and other authors have written on the same subject. And what better account have I of the master argument? But if I were vain enough, I might, especially at some entertainment, astonish all the company by an enumeration of authors relating to it. Chrysippus has written wonderfully in his first book of possibilities. Cleanthes and Academus have each written separately on the subject. Antipater too has written, not only in his treatise of possibilities, but especially in a discourse on the master argument. Have you not read the work? No. Read it then. And what good will it do him? He will be more trifling and impertinent than he is already. For what else have you gained by reading it? What conviction have you formed upon this subject? But you tell us of Helen and Priam and the Isle of Calypso, something which never was, nor ever will be. And in these matters, indeed, it is of no great consequence if you retain the story without forming any principle of your own. But it is our misfortune to do so, much more, in morality, than upon such subjects as these. Attic Nights by Aulus Gellius But Diodorus, surnamed Cronus, says... No word is ambiguous, and no one speaks or receives a word in two senses, and it ought not to seem to be said in any other sense than that which the speaker feels that he is giving it. But when I, said he, meant one thing, and you have understood another, it may seem that I have spoken obscurely rather than ambiguously. For the nature of an ambiguous word should be such that he who speaks it expresses two or more meanings. But no man expresses two meanings. Who has felt that he is expressing but one? Sextus Empiricus, Outlines of Pyrrhonism Moreover, there is also this to be said. If something is moved, either it is moved in a location where it is, or in a location where it is not. But it cannot be moved in the location where it is, for it is there that is where it rests. Nor can it be moved in the location where it is not, for where something is not, there it cannot act or be acted upon. This argument is that of Diodorus Cronus, and it has many refutations, of which, on account of the character of our treatise, we shall set out only the most striking ones, together with a judgment about them, as it appears to us. Sextus Empiricus Against the Physicians Concerning the primary and most fundamental elements. Diodorus, surnamed Cronos, minimal and indivisible bodies. I then skip ahead. Before we begin our criticisms, we must observe that there have been three main views regarding motion. Some say motion exists, others that it does not exist, and others that it is no more existent than non-existent. That it exists is affirmed both by ordinary folk, who pay attention to appearances, and by the majority of physicists, such as Pythagoras and Empedocles and Anaxagoras and Democritus and Epicurus. To those who view also the Peripatetics have subscribed, and the Stoics as well, and a host of others. But its non-existence is affirmed by Parmenides and Melissus, whom Aristotle has described as Nature's Stationers and Anti-Naturalists. Stationers from Standing Still, and Anti-Naturalists because Nature is the first principle of motion, and it they abolished by declaring that nothing moves. For what moves must complete a certain interval, but every interval is incapable of being completed because it admits of division ad infinitum so that no moving thing will exist. And with these men, 
Diodorus Cronus also is in agreement, unless it should be said that according to him, something has moved, but not a single thing is moving, as we shall explain later in the course of our argument, when we come to examine his view more closely. For the present, it is enough to notice this point, that he too is of the same opinion as those who have abolished motion, and that motion is no more existent than non-existent has been stated by the skeptics, for motion is an existent thing if we are to judge by appearances, but judging by a philosophical argument, it is non-existent. A lengthy section follows, dealing with arguments for and against motion. I am skipping ahead to the next part that specifically names Diodorus Cronus. And another weighty argument for the non-existence of motion is adduced by Diodorus Cronus. He establishes that not a single thing is in motion, but that it has been moved. The fact that nothing is in motion follows from his assumptions of indivisibles, for the indivisible body must be contained in an indivisible place. Therefore, it must not move in the place it occupies, for it fills it up. A thing that is to move must have a larger place to do so nor does it move within the place in which it is not, for it is not there yet to be moving therein. Consequently, it is not in motion. But according to reason, it has been in motion, for that which was formerly observed in this place is now observed in another place, which would not have occurred if it had not been moved. Thus this man, in trying to support his own dogma, has admitted what is an absurdity, for how is it other than absurd to say that while nothing moves, something has moved. But the skeptics, being equally in doubt about motion, and having been in motion, would not assent to any absurdity, such as Diodorus has admitted. This man, however, propounds the familiar argument to show that nothing moves when he says, if a thing moves, it moves either in the place where it is, or in the place where it is not. But it moves neither in the place where it is, for it remains therein, nor in that where it is not, for it does not exist therein, therefore nothing moves. Such, then, is his argument, and the method of proving its premises is obvious. For as there are two places, the first being that wherein a thing is, and the second that wherein it is not, and it being impossible to conceive a third place in addition to these two, the thing in motion, if it really moves, must move in one of these places, for it will not move in an inconceivable place. Now it does not move in the place wherein it is, for it fills it up, and so long as it exists therein, it remains, and remaining therein, it does not move. And it is likewise impossible for it to move in the place wherein it is not, for where a thing does not exist, there it cannot affect anything, nor can it be affected. And in the same way it cannot move. And just as no one could say, that he who is in Rhodes is moving in Athens, so too, in general, one will not say of a body that it moves in the place where it does not exist. Hence, if there are two places, that wherein it exists, and that wherein it exists not, and it has been proved that the moving object cannot move in either of them, the moving object will not exist. Such, then, is the method of proving his argument, but it is posed by many in various ways and we shall in the next place expound their objections. Thus, some assert that if preterites are true, it is impossible that the present cases should be true. Similarly, the preterites must be false when the presents are false. For that thing wherever limit exists, exists also itself, and if a thing non-existent, no limit will exist. And if the preterite is a limit of the present, it is therefore necessary that when the preterite, which is a limit, exists, the present, also, whereof it is the limit, should exist. And just as the preterite to have become is nothing if the preterite, or if the present to become is not true, and just as the preterite to have perished is nothing if the present to perish has not pre-existed, so too it is impossible that the preterite to have moved should be true if the present to move is not true. 
Others assert that a thing can move in the place wherein it is contained. For the balls which spin on their, around on their pivots and revolving axles and drums and potter's wheels and hosts of bodies similar to these move, but move in the place wherein they are. So that one premise of the argument, that nothing moves in the place where it is, is false. And others assert that the argument is propounded contrary to the conception of motion. For the moving object is conceived in conjunction with the place wherefrom it moves and that whereto it moves. Consequently, when Diodorus says, if a thing moves, it moves either in the place wherein it is or in that wherein it is not. He says what is unsound and contrary to the conception of motion, inasmuch as the moving body or moving object does not move either in the place wherein it is or in that wherein it is not, but rather through both places, both that wherefrom and that whereto it moves. And there have been some who have discerned an ambiguity, for being contained in a place, they say, has two meanings. In the one, in a place is used in the broad sense, as when we say of a man that he is in Alexandria, and in the other it is used of place in the exact sense, as the air which is moulded round the surface of my body might be said to be my place, and the jar is called the place of what is contained in it. So as place is now applied in two ways, they assert the moving object can move in the place wherein it is, place in the broad sense, as this possesses extension through which the processes of motion may take place. And some have thought that the argument of Diodorus is inconclusive, since it begins with a disjunctive premise, and falsifies this by means of the succeeding statements, in that it proves that both its clauses are false, both that a thing moves in the place where it is not, and that it does so where it is. Such are the objections against the argument, but Diodorus seems to have answered the first one at once by explaining that when preterites are true, their presence admit of being false. For suppose that a certain man married a year before, and another man a year after. Then in the case of these men, the proposition, these men married, which is a preterite, is true. But these men are marrying, which is a present, is false. For when this man was marrying, that man was not yet marrying. And when that man was marrying, this other man was no longer marrying. And in their case, the proposition, these men are marrying, would have been true of them only if they had been marrying simultaneously. It is possible, then, for the present to be false when the preterite is true. Of the same sort, too, is a proposition, Helen had three husbands. For neither when she had Menelaus as her husband in Sparta, nor when she had Paris in Ilium, nor when, after his death, she married Dephobus, is the present, she has three husbands, true, though the preterite, she had three husbands, is true. But here Diodorus is using sophistry and wishes to deceive us by ambiguity. For the proposition these men married has two senses, of which the one is plural and equivalent to these men married together, which is false, but the other is formed by the combination of one singular proposition, this man married, and another singular proposition, that man married, and of these singulars again the presents are true, namely, this man is marrying, and that man is marrying, for these statements are true in both cases. It is then impossible, if the presents are false, that their preterites should be found to be true, and of necessity, both of them must either be abolished together or coexist along with each other. Nevertheless, Diodorus brings forward another argument against the same assumption, in which he employs a clearer example. Let a ball, he says, be thrown onto an overhanging roof. Then, at the time, or at the point of time that is midway in the throw, the proposition, the ball touches the roof, is false, for it is still on its way. But when it has touched the roof, the preterite, the ball has touched the roof, becomes true. Therefore, it is possible for the preterite to be true when the present is false, and therefore possible for a thing not to be moving in the present, but to have moved in the preterite. But I suspect that he, here, too, he goes astray. For the present, the ball touches the roof, is not true when the ball is travelling in mid-air, but when it begins to touch the roof. 
but when it comes down again, after ending its contact, then the preterite becomes true, the ball touched the roof. Therefore it is absurd of Diodorus to accept to have moved as true and to reject to move as false, when he ought either to assent to both or to reject both. And those who declare that a thing can move in the place where it is, by alleging the examples now of balls and now of axles and drums, fail to solve the difficulty and are equally entangled in it. For as we have shown previously, each of these bodies remains in the same place as a whole, but in respect to its parts, it changes places, the part above occupying instead the place below, and the part below the place above. And if so, the difficulty remains. For each part of these bodies moves either in the place where it is, or in that where it is not. But it moves neither in the place where it is, as we have established, nor in that where it is not, as we have proved. Therefore, it doesn't move. But in the next place, some have asserted that the argument thus brought forward is contrary to the conception of a moving object. For a moving object is conceived as occupying two places, both that wherefrom it moves and that into which it passes. But in answers, or in answer to these two, it is easy to say that, even if it is the fact that the motion the notion of the moving object is of this kind, it has no bearing on our problem, because the question now before the doubters is chiefly concerned not with the conception of motion, but with its real existence. And about this, those who make that sort of objection have said nothing. And moreover, even if we overthrow the argument, they will have nothing to say against us. For when they assert that the moving object occupies two places, both that wherein it is and that to which it moves, we shall ask them, when does the moving object pass over from the place wherein it is to the other place? Is it when it is in the first place or when it is in the second? But when it is in the first place, it does not pass over into the other, for it is still in the first. And when it is not in this, but in the second, once again, it is not passing over, but has already passed over. For it is a thing impossible and inconceivable that anything should pass over from that place wherein it does not exist. So that, even if we have this sort of conception of the moving object, the original difficulty remains nonetheless. Further, those who say that the term place has two senses, the broad sense and the exact, and that therefore motion can occur in a place when conceived as broad, are giving an answer that is not to the purpose. For place conceived as exact precedes place conceived as broad, and it is impossible for anything to move in broad place if it has not moved before in exact place. For as the latter serves to contain the moving body, so the broad place contains, along with the moving body, the exact place as well. As then, no one can move over a distance of a stade without first having moved over a distance of a cubit, so it is impossible to move over broad place without moving over exact place. And when Diodorus propounded the argument against motion, which has been set forth, he was keeping to the exact sense of place. So if in its case motion was abolished, there is no argument left in case of place in the broad sense. Now it's perfectly foolish to say that the argument is unsound because of its beginning with a disjunctive premise and asserting the falsity of its premise. For the steps in the argument are in logical sequence and the force they have is this. If a thing moves, it must move in one or other of the ways stated above. But the second clause is not true, therefore the first is not true. For if the second is true when the first is true, when the second is not true, the first will not be true either, and this is sound according to the assumptions of the dialecticians themselves. These observations, then, it was necessary to make in order. Well, these observations, then, it was necessary to make in answer to the objections made against the argument brought forth by Diodorus, and he also brings forward other arguments which are not so weighty but more sophistical. 
and of these we shall give an exposition so as to be able to avoid each of them in our investigations. For instance, he says, the moving object is in a place, and that which is in a place does not move. Therefore, the moving object does not move, and motion being twofold, the one sort that of the major portion, the second sort absolute, and that of the major portion being the sort in which, while most parts of the body are in motion, a few are at rest, and the absolute sort, that in which all the parts of the body are in motion, it seems that of these two motions, that of the major portion precedes the absolute kind. For in order that a thing should move absolutely, that is, as a whole, wholly, it must first be conceived as moving in respect of its major portion. Just as, in order that a man may become completely grey-headed, he must first become grey as to the major part. And in order to obtain a complete heap, the major part of the heap must first be formed. In much the same way, motion as to the major part must precede absolute motion, for absolute motion is an intensification of that major part. But there does not exist any motion of the major part, as we shall establish. Neither, then, will absolute motion exist. For let us assume the existence of a body composed of three indivisible parts, two being in motion and one motionless. For this is what motion of the major part demands. If, then, we were to add to this body a fourth indivisible, which is motionless, there will again be motion. For if the body composed of three indivisibles, two in motion and one motionless, moves, it will also move when a fourth indivisible is added. For the three indivisibles, which were moving, are stronger than the one indivisible, which was just added. But if the body composed of four indivisible moves, that composed of five will also move. For the four indivisibles, with which it was moving before, are stronger than the fifth added indivisible. And if that which is composed of five moves, it will certainly move also when a sixth is added, the five being stronger than the one. And in this way, Diodorus proceeds up to 10,000 indivisibles by way of proving that motion of the major part is non-existent. For it is absurd, he says, to, absur to assert that a body moves as to its major part when it has 9,998 of its indivisibles motionless and two only in motion. So that nothing moves as to its major part, and if so, neither does anything move absolutely, from which it follows that nothing moves. Listener, I am again skipping ahead. If you'd like to see the rest of Sextus's response, please see the text file. Or just look up the original text, I suppose. Here we go. Those who, like Epicurus, have assumed that all things are reducible to indivisibles, involve themselves in more formidable difficulties. Such as, firstly, the fact that motion will not exist, as Diodorus showed when treating of indivisible places and bodies. For the indivisible body contained in the first indivisible place does not move, for it is contained in the indivisible place and fills up. And again, the body situated in the second place does not move, for it has moved already. But if the moving object neither moves in the first place, inasmuch as it exists in the first, nor yet in the second, and besides these no third place is conceived, then that which is said to move does not move. And even apart from this sort of difficulty, it is possible to attack the position of the Epicureans by means of a hypothetical case. I skip ahead once more and we'll leave it to you whether you wish to read Sextus's hypothetical case. Some also, fastening on the times of becoming and perishing, argue thus. If Socrates died, he died either when he was living or when he was dead. But he did not die while living, for assuredly he was living, and as living 
he had not died, nor when he died, for then he would be twice dead. Therefore Socrates did not die. And to the same effect, although using a different example, Diodorus Cronus propounded an argument of this kind. If the wall perishes, the wall perishes either while the stones are touching one another and are fitted together, or when they are disparted. But neither when they touch one another and are fitted together, nor when they are disparted, does the wall perish. Therefore the wall does not perish. Such is the argument, and the force of it is quite plain. There are two times conceived, that in which the stones touch one another and are fitted together, and that in which they are disparted. And besides these, no third time can be conceived. If, then, the wall perishes, it must perish in one or other of these times. But it cannot perish in the time when the stones are touching one another and are fitted together, for it still exists as a wall, and if it exists it does not perish, nor in the time when they are disparted from one another, for then it no longer exists as a wall, and the non-existent cannot perish. If, then, the wall does not perish, either when the stones are touching one another, or when they are disparted from one another, the wall does not perish. And it is possible to argue thus, if a thing both becomes and perishes, it becomes and perishes either in the time in which it exists, or in that in which it does not exist. But in that in which it exists, it neither becomes nor perishes. For inasmuch as it exists as this thing, it neither becomes nor perishes, nor yet will it undergo any of these affections in the time in which it does not exist. For in the time in which a thing does not exist, it can neither affect nor be affected at all. And if so, nothing either becomes or perishes. And that's the end of this recording. Have a nice day.